So a reminder that Monday is your next quiz. It will cover, as I said, everything since the last quiz, which primarily is because we got all the way through cash flows in the last quiz. We haven't talked about growth rates and terminal value and the loose ends. Basically, the, those are the three big things. Because after that, we went into actually valuing individual companies where all you're doing is applying what we did in the previous sections. So I thought I'd start today's class again with some of the issues you run into in valuation. We talked a few about a few of them. So let's assume that you're looking at commodity companies. And let's start with the truism. The earnings for commodity companies will go up and down as commodity prices go down. Right? So given that earnings go up and down, do you also expect their values to go up and down as commodity cycle? Do you see what I'm asking? Because we know earnings go up and down. Okay? Should you expect the value to also then be a function of where in the cycle you're in? Let's make the question easier. What will make your value go up and down with the earnings? Is if you built a model where you take base year earnings and you always apply a positive growth rate, right? Because then after a good year, your company is going to be worth a lot and bad year, it's going to be worth less. So if you just make mechanical valuations, guess what? Your values go up and down as earnings go up. But your job in valuation is to look past the cycle. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is what do you do with commodity companies when you know that your value is a function of the commodity price, but you have no idea where the commodity price is going, which is pretty much how I would characterize pretty much every commodity now. That wasn't always true. In the 1980s, oil companies used to have what they called a normalized oil price, which they used for making big decisions about $25, because they said the price goes up above $25, it comes back to $25. And it worked for almost 15 to 20 years. And then they moved to $40, and it seemed to work for a while. And then, of course, you had that boom for a period. And then you had the bust. And then people waiting for it to boom again and not happening. And now I think people are just incredibly confused. I think next week we should value Aramco. What do you think? Because the, the report just came out, most profitable company in the world. Man, I just, I just thought about it. So let, let, I, I'll, I'll start putting things together. You start pulling things too. The problem with Aramco, of course, is where do I get that annual report? You don't. There is no annual report. It's all these flick, it, it trickles of information they reveal. So it'll be interesting because you're really not valuing Aramco. You're valuing Saudi Arabia, Inc., because the line between Saudi Arabia and Aramco is, it, you don't know where the company ends and where the country begins. So it's a messy valuation. So maybe we'll try that next week. Let's talk about, so the, we'll talk about what to do about the fact that, because it's a given. You, you can't complain. You can complain about it if you want, but your value has to reflect. So let's assume now we move to banks. Today, if I get a chance, towards the very end of the session, I might talk about valuing banks how it's become so much more difficult to value banks. Okay. So you have a regulatory capital ratio. So you're valuing a bank where it's very conservatively capitalized. Its regulatory capital ratio is much higher than the regulatory minimum. So when you look at this bank and you're saying, where in the fundamentals would I expect to see it? I'm going to list out a few combinations. So this is a bank that is very conservatively capitalized. Tell me what you should expect to see in this bank. Should you expect to see a high return in equity and low risk? Why not? Because if you have a lot of capital, your return in equity is going to be low. So low risk part holds, but you're probably not going to see high return in equity. If you do, it's a, it's a bargain. You should buy the bank. So if you have a conservatively funded bank, you should expect to see lower returns in equity and lower risk. You think that's obvious, but the mechanisms we have for bringing into bank valuation are very limited because until it's, it's still true in many cases that banks are valued using a dividend discount model. Where the cost of equity is actually the average cost of equity across banks. We actually don't adjust for differences across banks because there's, you, the beta is not what you can use to change this. So we're going to talk about what to do when you have a risky bank as opposed to a safe bank. And I'll be quite honest, 10 years ago, this, this debate wouldn't even have come up. I didn't even know what to make, because the assumption was regulatory authorities will keep us from ever having to value risky banks, because banks are not allowed to take that kind of risk. They'll stop them. So we're going to wrestle with banks, because to me, that's become this new dark place to go in valuation, is how do you value a bank? One final thing is when you're done with, you know, many as you did, and you come up with a value that's different from the price, 
I won't even ask you to answer this question because this is a question you shouldn't answer. You should just do. You got a value. It's different from the price. What do you plan to do now? And I'm going to talk about that word faith again. And, and I'm going to talk about why it's so difficult to maintain it and how it gets tested. Because that's why we do valuation is to be able to act on it. And it's really, really, really difficult to pull the trigger. Right. And you know, you, many of you came up with undervalued stocks, but I'd wager that if I looked at your portfolio, that stock's not there yet. And, and I don't blame you. That's, you know, getting that, that, that last, the take, acting on your valuation requires faith. So we'll, we'll pick up to a one, oh, we'll, final point. Let's say you're sick and tired of this MBA program. You decide to quit and go to weather forecasting school. I'm sure there's a school somewhere that teaches weather forecasting. You're required to have nice hair <laughs> and pointed blank walls and get the right state. And you know, a lot of weather forecasters, they actually, put, they know where Arizona is. So when they point at the wall, they get, you know, bad weather forecasters are pointing at California and talking about Florida. So you, you go through weather forecast, you rise to the top of the rank. You're the, you're the top student in your class. You graduate, and your objective is to become a star weather forecaster. And I come to you with two job offers. The first is to be the weather forecaster in Honolulu, Hawaii. And the second is to be the weather forecaster in Epping, North Dakota. I have never been in Epping. I don't plan to be in Epping. I don't want to be in Epping. But you know why I picked these two cities? Honolulu, Hawaii is the most predictable weather in the United States, in terms of range of temperature, dry days followed by wet days. Epping, North Dakota, has the least predictable weather. So I'm going to ask you the easy question first. In which of these cities are you going to be more right as a weather forecaster? It's going to be 83 and sunny tomorrow in Honolulu. You know what? I haven't even looked at the temperature. I'm probably pretty close to the truth. If you become weather forecast in Honolulu, Hawaii, how often do you think you're going to get on TV? You're probably going to deliver coffee to the other news readers because everybody knows it's going to be 83 and sunny. But if you measure the quality of your job as precision of forecast, you're going to be more right in Honolulu, Hawaii. Epping North Dakota, you're going to be epically wrong most of the time, but people still listen to you. Have you ever noticed on the East Coast what happens when a blizzard is approaching? The news kind of changes, right? In fact, the whole world revolves around the weather forecaster for 29 minutes. In the last minute, the other news comes in today. Russia invaded Ukraine. This is, oh, back to <laughs> Bob, the weather forecaster. We know they're hopelessly wrong, but we watch, right? You think, what's this got to do with valuation? We already talked about valuing. Some companies are easy to value, the Coca-Colas of the world. Others are going to be difficult to value. If you measure your quality of where should I go, you're going to measure it in terms of precision. You'll be valuing nice, stable companies over and over again. You're going to be right, but so is everybody else. You want to find bargains, you've got to go where it's darker. So it's just a different way. So think Epping, North Dakota. It's like valuing Lyft. A lot of things I'm going to be wrong on. But people are listening, right? Because they want to know because there's so much uncertainty. So while you'll be tempted by the joy of precision, so somewhere along the way I want to talk about the difference between precision and accuracy. You know a precise model is? A precise model delivers the same numbers. So if you think about it like a dartboard, all your, you know, they're all close to each other. Precise model. An accurate model tries to get close to the truth. And the contrast, so you'd love to have a highly precise, highly accurate model, but what if you had to make a choice? Would you rather go for a highly precise model, where the model delivers the same number over and over again, even though it's wrong, or a highly accurate model, where the numbers might be all over the place, but you're trying to get to the right answer? I know what I want. I want a highly accurate model. But we value precision. So what wins out often are models that give precision over accuracy, and that's a problem. So hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about all of those different things. So let's go back to where we were. We're talking about valuing young companies. 
Any questions on valuing young companies? You're going to see a whole host of them go public this year. So get your valuation hat on, and there's going to be Palantir, and there's going to be Uber, and they're all going to go one after the other. It'll be interesting to both watch them at the time they go public and then watch them afterwards. I'm not going to give up on new lift just because they've gone public. The company's out there. There'll be more information that comes out. The game has just begun. So that's something you should think about doing at least for the rest of the years, trying to do those IPOs at the time of the prospectus. Don't wait for the banker to set an offering price because it'll make your valuation skewed. Try to do it before there's a number. So now I want to move on to valuing mature companies. And I said one of the pro normally when you think about valuing mature companies, they're relatively simple or easy to value because they're set in their ways. That's why we can take historical data and just project them out. But as we all know, you can get set in bad ways as well. One of the problems with mature companies is sometimes they start doing things that work well but no longer do, but they continue to do them. And somebody notices and pushes them to change. Okay. So when you look at a mature company and ask those four questions, what are your cash flows, what is the value of growth, how risky are you, and when will you become a mature company, the answers you get can depend very much on you know, whether you're looking at the status quo or whether the company changes. So when I ask you, what are your cash flows, you can give me one answer assuming the existing management runs it, and a very different one if the company changes. What's the value of growth? You can give me an answer based on what the company does right now, and a different answer if they change the way they grow, maybe grow more aggressively. When I ask you how risky are you, you can give me one answer, cost of capital, and a very different one if you change your policy on debt and have a different business model. You almost have two parallel sets of answers with two different end outcomes. You're saying, which one should I use? Let's stop at being abstract. Let's use an actual company. You ever heard of a company called Hormel Foods? Hormel Foods, you never heard of it? It makes perhaps the most disgusting food item that I've ever seen. It's meat in a can with a life beyond two nuclear wars. I don't know how you put meat in a can and it can live, but they figured out a way to do it. I don't even want to know how. It's called Spam. The history of Spam is actually very interesting. You know why Spam was invented, right? After the Second World War, the US Army was flying soldiers back from the Far East back to the US. And they didn't have aircraft that could do the entire flight. So the planes would stop in Hawaii. Not the Hawaii of today with five-star hotels, the Hawaii of the 1940s. Hundreds of thousands of hungry soldiers, not vegan, they like meat, landing in Hawaii, and the army did not know how to feed them. So it put out a requisition to companies saying, we need to feed the meat. We don't have refrigeration. We don't have, so find us a way that we can feed the meat that does not have to be refrigerated, preferably in cans that you can ship to us. And Hormel rose to the challenge, came up with Spam. You know, if you go to Hawaii and you go through bookstores, they still have a lot of Spam cookbooks. Spam casserole, stir fry, spam. It stays disgusting no matter what you do to it, but they figured out 150 disgusting things you can do with Spam. So for the company's been around a long time. It's, made, it's a profitable company with a long-standing history of success, but it's run by a very conservative management. Conservative in what sense? This management doesn't even realize there is a world outside the U.S. So it's been very U.S.-centric in its investing. So it doesn't invest very much, and it doesn't like to borrow money. So they have very low debt ratios, very low reinvestment rates. So here's what I did first. I valued Hormel assuming the existing management would be stuck in its ways. Low reinvestment, low. And it shows up in two places. The low reinvestment rate of, four, of um, in this case, the reinvestment rate was... 14% translates into a low growth rate. So they don't reinvest much, they grow at a very low rate. The low debt ratio translates into a higher cost of capital than they could conceivably have. But with those numbers built in, I get a value of $31.91. So let's file that as a way as a status quo value. Value the company, run as is. Now, food companies, especially in the last 15 years, have come, come under pressure to change. Hershey's look like this again until change came. So I did a second valuation assuming a more aggressive management team ran the company. Aggressive on two grounds. One is it will try to grow globally and perhaps accept a lower return capital. I'm being realistic that if you try to grow, you might have to accept lower return capital. And second, that they'd be willing to use more debt. How much more? 
well, I'm going to use a 40% debt ratio, but I'm going to back up where the 40% comes from because a higher debt ratio doesn't always translate in lower cost to capital. In this case, it does. So more aggressive growth and a higher cost to capital. I revalue the company. I, I'm sorry, lower cost to capital. The value that I get is about $37.80. I have two values, $31.91, $37.80. And the stock was trading at about $33. See the quandary I face? If I compare it to the $31.91, the stock looks overvalued. If I compare it to the, the $37.80, it looks undervalued. But I don't get to pick and choose. These are two different outcomes. So the last piece of the puzzle here was I had to ask, what is the chance that change will come to Hormel Foods? So what are some of the things I might want to look at there? Before I even do that, if I saw Class A and Class B shares, I know I'm already doomed. Right? So first thing I'm going to look at is you have two classes of shares, and the founders control the Class A shares. Change is not coming. Thank God there's only one class of shares. Second, I said, somebody, I can't make the change happen. I only own 1,000 shares. So, so I looked at the top 70. Remember that eight, you know, the, the top stockholders in a company can be looked up. You can look at it on Yahoo Finance. You can look it up on Bloomberg. I looked at the top 17 stockholders. Say, is there anybody on this list? And I was praying and hoping I'd see a Carl Icahn on the list. Not because Carl likes me, but he might push for change, and I could go along. I could basically you know, ride his coattails for change. There was no Carl Icahn. The largest shareholder was the Hormel Foundation. The original Hormel family that founded the company has long since you know, moved away from the management, but they own 20% of the shares in a foundation. So I said, who runs the foundation? So I took a look at who chaired the foundation. It was chaired by the CEO of Hormel. I think we're going to have a bit of a problem with change here because 20% of the shares are owned by the, by, uh, by the foundation. The chairman is the CEO. It's going to make change a lot more difficult. Not impossible, because Hershey is in exactly the same scenario until somebody said, we've got all the foundation money in this company. If you keep running the company to the ground, we're all going to go to the ground. So it doesn't make change impossible. It makes change less likely. Attach a 90% chance that the company will not change. Why? Because at the moment, it doesn't look like it's coming. A 10% chance of change coming. My expected value was $32.50, a little lower than the stock price. So what's my conclusion? I'm not buying Hormel. You know what could change tomorrow? What, what would I like to, what could I see as a new story in the Wall Street Journal that overnight could make me go from being somebody who's not buying the stock to buying it? Some name out there, Bill Ackman announces that he's targeted Hormel. That's all you need, right? Because the values don't change. What, what does that change? This is why when an activist investor appears in a company, you're going to see the price jump. Why? Because it's not that the value itself has changed, but because the chance of change has happened. In fact, at a macro level, countries have, have tried to create corporate governance laws, which cover all companies. So let's say you're, you're looking at a country which has terrible corporate governance. What's going to happen? What's your definition of terrible corporate governance? The probability of change is very close to zero. So everybody's tracing, trading close to the status quo value. The country announces it's going to put together a legislative package, and this, it actually means it, to make corporate governance better. First, give me the macro effect. What's, what's that going to do to stock prices in that company? They're going to go up. But then if I divide that market up into bad companies and good companies, badly managed and, and well-managed companies, which group is going to see the biggest jump in the price? to badly managed companies. If any of you want a thesis to check out, you could take corporate governance laws that have been passed in the last 20 years, look at the effect, because the hypothesis would be, if this is about corporate governance, the worst managed companies, we should see the biggest jump. So let's draw some lessons from looking at mature companies. One is don't take managers at their word, because managers often in these mature companies talk about cutting costs. Sounds great, they get the news story in the Wall Street Journal. But the reality is when companies announce that they will cut costs, they often don't carry through. So this is from a McKinsey study, from the McKinsey Quarterly, which looked at what are the factors that lead some companies to carry through, because it turns out a third of companies carry through on their promises, two-thirds don't. So the study looked at what, and I'm not suggesting any of these is a guarantee, but when you look at cost cuts, you want specificity. You want something where the management says, this is where we're going to cut costs, rather than $3 billion in cost cuts. And you want to see management feel some of the pain. In other words, is this a cost cut that the people who are talking about the cost cut actually feel? Because otherwise, you tend not to see these cost cuts actually go through. 
So first, when you see cost cuts, don't fall for it and reduce your cost by that amount. See if it actually shows up. Second, many, young co many companies in trouble, mature companies, they want a consultant to come in and give them a pathway to grow faster. Because they think their trouble is they're growing too slow. So we think about growing. There are lots of different ways you can grow. Okay? So this is again from another McKinsey study. The reason I keep quoting McKinsey is if any of you have read the McKinsey Quarterly, which is a magazine you can subscribe to, you can you know it's free. So try it out. They do a lot of studies with their internal data, and they have incredible data because among their clients is you know, three quarters of the S&P 500 for 50 years, so they go, go back and mine the database. So this is what they did in this study. They went and looked at all the companies in the database, looked at the different ways in which companies grew, and then ranked them from best to worst in terms of value creation. So the top of the list was was companies that actually you know, go out and grow by introducing new products. Yeah. Next on the list were companies that expand their existing market. The bottom of the list were companies that tried to grow in an existing market by cutting prices. And of course, at the very bottom of the list were companies that grew through acquisitions. The reason I make that case is growth by itself is not what creates value. It's whether you can create value with the growth by taking projects that make more than your cost of capital. And I'll show you versions of this graph at different points in time. But if you look across U.S. companies, uh, I'm sorry, across global companies, it's actually very depressing, the percentage of companies that destroy value as they grow. So mature companies that say they want to grow, I'm not sure you're going to get a higher value with that higher growth unless you can earn more than your cost of capital. Which brings me to my third point about mature companies. Remember that 40% debt ratio? No, my... My usual sequence is I do corporate finance in the first year and valuation in the second, since most of you were not in my corporate finance class. This is a big part of my corporate finance class. In the middle of the class, we talk about optimal debt ratios. And if you strip it down to basics, I use the cost of capital as my tool for deciding what the right mix of debt and equity should be for a company. So here's what I do. I have the debt ratio going from 0 to 90%. I want to see what debt ratio minimizes my cost of capital. You think that's going to be easy? Just change the weights. But remember, as I change my debt ratio, everything changes. Like what? My equity gets riskier. My cost of equity goes up. My debt gets riskier. The bank is not going to keep lending me money, so the cost of debt will go up. The cost of capital is a trade-off. As I change the debt ratio, initially my cost of capital might go down because the benefits exceed the cost. But there's some point, in the case of Hormel, that's between 30 and 40 percent, where debt turns against me. I'm seeing the wrong side of debt. My cost of capital starts to go up. My optimal debt ratio is not whatever the industry averages. That's become the conventional part of practice for target debt ratios. It's what I can carry that minimizes my cost of capital. The reason I picked the 40% debt ratio for Hormel is because it minimizes their cost of capital. If you gave me a different company, my optimal might be 20, 50, 80, depending on the company. So when you look at mature companies and you're trying to fix them on your spreadsheet, don't just push up the debt ratio, leave everything else alone. Figure out what it will do to your cost of capital and incorporate the full effects. So mature companies, some of you are valuing mature companies. One of the things you might consider is what if change comes to the company. And in your spreadsheet, it'll be higher reinvestment, no, no higher growth, lower cost of capital. Whatever it is you pick, you're going to come up with a value that reflects what you can change in the company. We'll come back to this topic later in the class when we talk about value enhancement. Now let's talk about what is perhaps the most depressing task in valuation, valuing declining companies. You know the most difficult part about valuing declining companies is? Okay. You have to use negative numbers. We're not used to doing it. We don't like doing it. M putting a minus 5% revenue growth rate for the next 10 years sounds unnatural. But for some companies, you have to. So with declining companies, when you ask the questions, here's what it'll look like. When I ask you, what are your cash flows from your existing assets, and you show me your history, Here's what I would see in your history. Often revenues are flat or dropping, and your margins are under pressure. When I ask you what's the value of growth, often value, growth is either destroying value or you don't have any growth looking forward. When I ask you what's your cost of capital, it could shift as you change your business mix and your debt ratio changes. And I ask you when will you be a mature company, you say it was 10 years ago, because you're, not, I mean, you're past mature. Everything gets more difficult because you're at the wrong end of the life cycle. So let's talk, start, start to talk about decline. It, mechanically, 
it's not difficult to value a declining company. You put in lower revenue growth, it's in fact negative revenue growth, so your revenues get smaller. So let's take a JC Penny. So my revenues will shrink by 25% over the next five years. You adjust your margins to reflect the fact that you're in a competitive business and margins might drop. You don't try to grow because you know that growth will only destroy value. And you come up with a value that reflects where you are as a company. So with negative growth, divestitures, and a changing cost, you say, this is my value. You know what will kill your valuation, though? Is if this company is run by a management that is in denial. Deni denial in what sense? They act like they're running a growth company. They continue to reinvest a lot even though they have no projects. They continue to borrow money even though they shouldn't be. And in the process, they end up demolishing your company. So it's almost when you value a company, valuing a company like this, you have to take a stand at the management and say, is this a management that understands that this is not a company that you can go out and grow or borrow money against? So again, when you talk about two valuations, you might value a declining company reflecting reality and then revalue the company saying, the CEO running the company is in denial. I'll get very different numbers because of that. So let's try this. As I said, J.C. Penney, perfect example of everything coming together as a declining company. Remember we talked about stories. This is not a fun story to tell. It's a story about a company that is in a business that has been disrupted, that is not even is being disrupted, has been disrupted. The future does not look good. In fact, it looks like their best case scenario is they become a smaller company in a niche part of the business. And my story reflects that. Over the next, uh, if you look at the next 10 years, as you go through time, for the first five years at least, minus 3%. What does that mean when I have minus 3%? I'm shutting stores down. And if I'm picking the right stores to shut, I'm hoping my margins improve. I'm cutting down my high. It's hope, but I'm hoping the margins improve. And I'm hoping my returns and capital climb, not to some unrealistic level, but by the end, time I get to year 10, that I'm earning at least my cost to capital. That's my best case scenario. A smaller firm which is in a shrunk business but earning its cost of capital. So when you look at the value based upon that story, you come up with the value for the firm of $4.8 billion. But this is a declining firm. If it declines much faster than I expected, it could very well go out of business. So attach a probability that the company will not make it. You bring in that probability, the expected value for the operating assets is down to $4.4 billion. It's not an upbeat story, but it's a story that reflects where JCPenney is today. So when I was looking at your retail company valuations, one of the questions, so if you put in a high growth rate for a retail company, well, it's, I mean, I don't know whether you classify Lululemon as a retail company, but it's an apparel slash retail, you've got to come up with a much stronger story in the business because the rest of the business is, in a sense, melting down on you. So declining companies, that's the first issue. The second issue is, and yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's a good question. When you have negative growth, what am I doing? I'm shutting stores down. When I shut stores down, what am I hoping? This is my best case scenario. I'm getting out of leases that some of This was the Eddie Lampert plan for Sears 10 years ago, right? He was going to shut stores down and get out. It didn't work out that well for him for two reasons. One was timing. He took his position in 2008, so he had that real estate thing swipe him. The second was he found it was much more difficult to extract yourself from leases than he thought it was going to be. So when you see a negative reinvestment rate, you're basically shrinking invested capital. You're getting out of business. You're divesting the assets. And that provides a So that's one of the few bonuses you get from a negative growth story is your free cash flows can actually be higher than your after-tax operating income because of those cash flows you get by selling assets. Okay. So it's a, again, part, it has to be part of the story. If your assets cannot be sold and there's no liquidation value, you can't even do the negative. So you get the worst of both worlds. You get low growth and no cash coming back from the assets you're shutting off. Now let's make it even messier. Let's suppose you have a declining company with a lot of debt. <clears throat> if you're a declining company with a lot of debt, you have a sword hanging over you, right? Because you're shrinking, you have all this debt payment due. If you're not careful, the sword will fall on you and you go bankrupt. And remember what I said about discounted cash flow valuations. Discounted cash flow valuations are going concern values. They value a company in the assumption that you'll make it and become a healthy company. And with a company like this, which is declining and in distress, that might not happen. And it's almost impossible. Let me take out the almost. I think it's impossible to bring distress into a discounted cash flow valuation simply because you can't have a going concern and then say it's going to go out of business, right? So what, what I'm going to do is actually do something unrealistic. I'm going to put an optimist hat on. 
I'm going to value your distressed company as if it's going to make it. I'm going to come up with a value. And then I'm going to ask two other questions. One is, what is the likelihood that I will not make it? And what will happen if I don't make it, if I get pushed out of business, if I'm liquidated? So let's make this again real. Company I'm going to value is called Las Vegas Sands. Familiar with Las Vegas Sands? It's a casino company. And one of the defining features for casino companies is they're usually run by megalomaniacs. <laughs> if you don't believe me, take a look at all of them. You know, Steve, it's, it's, all, it's almost part of the game. So that's part of the story. I'm not just throwing this as an insult. Las Vegas Sands is run by a guy called Sheldon Adelson, who owns 52% of the company. And that's going to become part of the story as well. So 2000s. Las Vegas Sands is growing aggressively. It's building casinos in Macau, in Singapore. They have this monstrosity called the Marina Bay Sands, where it looks like a ship trapped on top of a building. But these are huge, huge, huge real estate investments, usually costing a half a billion to a billion. If you have to make a half a billion to a billion dollar investment, you need capital, right? And what are the two ways you can raise capital as a business? Debt and equity. Las Vegas Sands pretty much borrowed every dollar that they spent on these casinos. Why? What does issuing equity mean? You're going to issue shares. And how, what did I say Sheldon Adelson owned? He owned 52% of the shares. And I described him as a megalomaniac. Megalomaniacs value control. You have 52%. You're worried that if you issue shares, you're going to lose control. So he borrowed money. So by 2003, 2004, he kept borrowing money building casinos. And when times are good, people don't notice. And then 2008 happens. And two things happen as a consequence. One is you get the global recession. People coming into casinos are basically fewer and they're spending less money. And the second is all those people who've lent you money are now freaking out. They want to know when you'll pay them. So this is a valuation I did for Las Vegas Sands in February of 2009. And I'll tell you, as I was doing the valuation, I was reading news stories about how Las Vegas Sands might not make it through the next six months. So I put my optimist hat on. How do we fix distressed, money-losing companies with a lot of debt on a spreadsheet? We know the template, right? What do we need to do? First, we need to improve its margins on the spreadsheet so the money-losing company becomes a money-making company. And then we go to the debt ratio. Over time, we make the debt ratio go down. We make its cost of capital reflect that of a healthy company. So Las Vegas Sands, I played it by the book. I fixed it. I fixed it on my spreadsheet. Made it. I didn't break any rules, but it was essentially creating a pathway back to health. And it shows up as this huge terminal value at the end of the 10th year. I discounted all back. I come up with a value per share of $8.12. And the stock was trading at about four twenty-five. dollars Ask me the question. Now, by now, you know the last piece. Am I buying? And I wasn't even tempted which led to some soul searching. Because if I truly believe my own DCF valuations, why wouldn't I buy at 812? Why didn't I want to buy? What are all the news stories I was reading that they might not make it? This is my value for Las Vegas Sands if it makes it and becomes healthy. And I'm worried about, hey, maybe they won't make it. So to complete this analysis, what do I need? I need to first estimate a likelihood that they will not make it, and then ask myself, how much will my equity be worth? if they don't make it. So let's start the first question. How would I get a probability that a company will not make it? As, I mean, how, do, how would I come up with that number? What are some of the things I would look at? Well, I could look at all the other casinos. But remember, historically, and what would I look at in those companies? That sounds like a rabbit hole out of which I would never come out, right? So I, would, I have to look more with a, with a little more focus. Otherwise, I'm going to get lost. In. That's a huge data analysis, right? So I can go back. And, you're asking me to do something like a probit or, a, in fact, that's how people do statistical analysis. They look at thousands of companies over time, and they look at the numbers that, you know, that went bankrupt. They put zero and one. They create this data analysis and create, I am valuing a company. I don't want to go look at all the data. You're right. You could do that if you're desperate. With Las Vegas Sands, there's probably an easier way to do it. I could look and give you the debt rating. It is a single B-rated company. And how does that help you? In fact, if you go to the ratings agencies, they have these tables that tell you the, like, the, the, the actual history of default by each ratings class. The 10-year probability of default for a B-rated company might be 25%. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put the 25% in, 
as my likelihood of default and come up with the consequences. But there's actually a way in which you can get an even more. So the problem there is I'm assuming the ratings agencies have the rating right and that the history of default is actually going to continue. I actually took a third ploy. Las Vegas Sands has bonds that are traded. Now normally when you price a bond, how do you do it? What do you do to price a bond? You take promise coupons and the promise face value and you discount them back at a default risk adjusted interest rate, right? I'm going to try something a little different. Las Vegas Sands had a seven-year bond that was trading at 529. Remember bonds, corporate and treasuries, have a $1,000 face value usually. So 529 means it's trading at a huge discount in value. It's trading at 529. So I know what the price is. It had a promise coupon of 6.375%, which means that if the promise coupons get delivered, I should get 63.75 every year for the next seven years. And at the end of, end of the seventh year, I should get the, my $1,000 back. Instead of discounting the promise coupons at the risk-adjusted rate, I discounted the expected coupons at a risk-free rate. Let me take the easier part of that. The risk-free rate, why? Because if I adjust the cash flows for risk, I shouldn't be adjusting the denominator as well. You're saying, how are you going to come up with the expected coupons? For you to get the coupon, what has to be true? The company's got to be around, right? So what I did was I took the promised coupons, I multiplied it by one minus the probability that you would not make it. So you've got to survive to make it. And then I set up the equation. So think of the equation. I know the price of the bond. I know the promised coupons. I know the, the risk-free rate. What's the only number I don't know? I don't know the probability that you will not make it. But I let the solver function in Excel come up with that for me. It came back with 13.5%. You're saying, what does that even mean? Based on the pricing of the bond, there's a 13.5% on an annual basis that the company will not make it. If you think about making it to year 10, which is where Nirvana waits for me, right? Remember the terminal value is in year 10. If I have a 13.5% chance of failing every year to make it to year 10, here's what I need to do. There's an 86.6% chance in year one, 86.6. So I've got to live through 10 years. And if you take the cumulative probability, it looks like if I trust the bond market, the bond market's telling me there's a 23% chance I will make it. And if I make it, the value per share is $8.12. The remaining 77% of the time, I will not be able to make my debt payments, and I'll liquidate the company. You're saying, what will I get? Whatever I can sell those casinos for. Who will buy those casinos? Probably another casino company that's equally bereft of cash. This is not a good liquidation scenario. In fact, there were a couple of casinos that were already going bankrupt in 2008, towards the end of 2008. I took a look at the numbers, and they were getting half of book value, a third of book value, because they were desperate. They were trying to sell real estate, not just real estate, but these huge properties. And there weren't that many potential buyers. I can almost guarantee you that if Las Vegas Sands gets pushed to the brink, can't make a debt payment, your equity is going to be worth nothing. And that's all I care about, right? Thank God the equity can't be worth less than nothing because then my problem would become much worse. But in the 77% of the time the company cannot make it, my equity is going to be worth nothing. Which gives me an expected value of $8.12 times 23%, the, time, the going concern property, plus zero times the remaining 77%. Value per share of $1.92. If your value... In fact, if any of you valued a distressed company, I have that number that some of you used off my spreadsheet of what is the probability that you will not make it. That's the number that you can move around to reflect the fact that many of these companies might not make it. Any questions? Yes. I'm sorry, why couldn't I use? Short interest as in the people who are selling short on the stock. Why is that a valuation concern? How is that affecting your, say, you can have everybody in his brother sell short in Tesla, but if they have the cash to make the debt payment, they have the cash to make the debt payment. You can have nobody shorting Tesla, and if they don't have the cash to make it, so I'm not sure shorting, it's a pricing issue. It might affect how quickly the price moves away from value or moves towards value. But from a valuation perspective, short interest tells me nothing about the fundamentals of the company. So I want something intrinsic for the company to build into my valuation. I'm not sure short interest. I, I thought you were going to ask me, why can't I just push the discount rate up for the company? In, in other words, you're saying there's a mechanism here for showing risk. Why do you have to bring this in externally? 
Why not push the discount rate up? And the answer to that is very simple. Discount rates value going concerns. They're designed for going concerned risk. This is a truncation risk. Risk you will not make it. It becomes almost impossible to incorporate into discount rates because your discount rate has to go towards infinity the day before you go bankrupt. And that's so, so that's why it's better to keep it separate and bring it in the last stage in the process. Yes? Oh, you're saying, well, if I keep it as a going concern, they do. That's why in a going concern valuation, I set the, so you think of the cost of debt when I did my cost of debt? I set the cost of debt at the promised, I compute the yield to maturity based on the promised payments being made. So in my discounted cash flow valuation, I'm actually being consistent in computing a going concern, and a going concern has to make its full promised payment. Otherwise, you see, so in my original DCF, I did use a pre-tax cost of debt based on the promised payment. Here I'm opening the door to the possibility. I'm saying, what if it's not a going concern? And here you can survive. As a bond investor, you're taking 60 cents on the dollar, and you'll accept it because you, know, it's not, you don't care about survival. You just care about collecting as much cash. But once you do that, then basically you have, you know, the, the bond ends, the going concern assumption breaks down, and I have to do a separate valuation. So almost this is, this is in the liquidation room. So you were in the intrinsic value room. There you got to stay consistent, make sure your promised payments made. You go into the liquidation room, all bets are off. It's, you know, because you're not assuming going concerns, you're going to take whatever you can get. That's why I'm doing the risk-free rate. As, as an investor in the bond, because I've adjusted the cash flows for default, I have risk adjusted already. All I have to do then is make the risk-free rate on that risk adjusted cash flow. You're saying if I did a default risk adjusted cash flow on historical bonds, would I earn the risk free rate or would I earn more? I think it's actually been done. I can look it up. It's, you get actually, if you adjust for default over time, over long periods, you get close to the risk free rate. In the US, you've tended to earn more for a very simple reason. You have a survivor bias. You took the most successful economy in the world, and then you said, did I make more? You probably did, because you caught an economy. But if you took across economies, my guess is you'd be lucky to make the risk-free rate after you've adjusted for default across all economies. But that's an interesting question. It's tough to test because in much of the world, you don't have corporate bonds, so you, you don't have the public data to make this test. The data exists for corporate bonds for a subset of US companies. But I think it's worth asking the question, after you've adjusted for default, collectively have bond investors earned close to the risk-free rate? My gut says yes, but I couldn't back it up with an empirical finding simply because that data is tough to get to. Yeah. Any other questions? Now let's talk about valuing emerging market companies. You look at emerging market companies, again, let's go through the four questions. By now you know the drill. Every, every one of these groups I'm asking the question, what are your cash flows from existing assets? You show me your financials. The problem with, the, with emerging market financials is you can be a great company, but your financials can look awful if the country goes to hell in a handbasket. Right? Then I ask you, what's the value of growth? You show me a value of growth. But there again, you say, well, I've taken the right projects, but if my country has a political scandal headed, that value of growth could become negative. And I ask you, how risky are you? Show me your risk as a company. You say, by the way, my country just goes through the roof. My cost of capital could go up. And I ask you, when will you become a mature company? Saying, well, run is a good company, but if the country goes to hell in a handbasket, we might not make it. Notice with every question, you tell me something about your company, but then you turn attention to the country. Everything has a country risk component to it. So when you value emerging market companies, let's say you're valuing a Brazilian company. Brazil is in the room with you while you're valuing the company. And it's almost unavoidable, but it does make valuation very difficult because while you're valuing the company, you're wrestling with these issues about the country. So here are some suggestions with emerging market companies. When you're valuing emerging market companies, the thing you're constantly thinking about, how do I punish the company for being an emerging market company? Fight the urge, because if you're not careful, you're going to punish it in multiple places. I'll tell you what often happens with emerging market company valuations. People project the cash flows to the emerging market company, and they haircut the cash flows. You know what haircutting is? They knock it off saying, it's a risky company. Then for the risk-free rate, they use the government bond rate from that country. 
So if you take Nigeria, they take the Nigerian government bond rate. Remember what we said about government bonds, they included a default risk component. So you punish the company for being a Nigerian company. Then for beta, they initially go look up betas for other steel companies in the world, and they come up with 0.8, but they say, oh, it's a Nigerian steel company, so I'm going to use 1.2. They get to the equity risk premium, and they punish the company one final time by giving it a really high risk premium. If you're not careful, you will punish the company multiple times for the same sin of being in an emerging market. It's amazing that any company can make it through and come out on the other side looking undervalued. So here's my suggestion. If you have an emerging market company and you're worried about emerging market risk, keep it focused on one number in evaluation. That way you can tell me this is how much I think about country risk, this is what I think it is, and if I disagree with you, then I know where to go. Because if you're in four different places, how do I know what to adjust if I don't agree with you? So here's an example. It's a company called Embraer. We've done, looked at their cost of capital earlier when we were talking. The Brazilian aerospace company. The valuation in May of 2008, and I did my valuation in U.S. dollars. I chose to do my valuation in U.S. dollars because in 2008, the Brazilian government still hadn't issued 10-year bonds in nominal reais, so I couldn't even do the little trick of getting a risk-free rate in reais. So I got a U.S. dollar cost of capital. And if you look at the U.S. dollar cost of capital, it looks like the, the cost of equity I have for the company is almost like the cost of equity of a mature market company. Remember I said 8 to 9% is what a mature market company company's cost of equities. So how come? They get almost 97% of their revenues in the U.S. and in developed markets. So we talked about country, how risk exposure comes from where you do business, not where you're incorporated. So I give them a low cost of equity. The mechanism I used for showing the low cost of equity was the Lambda approach. Why? Because at least at that time, I thought the only country I had to worry about with Embraer was Brazil. And all I had to do was capture the risk. And Lambda worked really well. You're saying, what if I'm in seven emerging markets? Don't try to do lambdas. Do the weighted average. But your, your views about country risk, the only place they show up in the valuation is through the equity risk premium. My risk-free rate is the T-bond rate. I'm not going to punish the company for being Brazilian by using a Brazilian dollar bond rate. My beta was a beta for an aerospace company, not an emerging market aerospace company, but just an aerospace company. The entire risk premium component is captured in that country risk premium and through the lambda. The rest of the valuation reflects what I've done with any other aerospace company anywhere in the world. Cash flows, the expected cash flows, the debt ratio, the cost of debt. So the value that I got for the company on a US dollar basis, $9.53, converted at the prevailing exchange rate on that day, I'd have got $15.72, which is actually pretty close to the actual price. The, the, the REI price was 17.2. So I got within you know, 7 8%. But this is, again, a case where I did my valuation in U.S. dollars simply because I was desperate. I could not do it in nominal reais. And everything I worried about was in that equity risk premium. So let's build on this. Currency is a choice. So when you're, if you're valuing emerging market companies, you're really struggling with the currency, you're valuing a Nigerian company, after about three or four days of struggling with the currency, if you really find yourself you know, off balance, value the company in a different currency. Just make sure you stay consistent. What does that mean? You do everything in U.S. dollars, your growth rate, your discount rate, your, everything has to be in U.S. dollars, stay consistent. So make currency a choice you make and then make sure you stay that consistent. And in fact, if you do exchange rates, if you're currency consistent, we talked about inflation being the driver. Make sure your forecast of exchange rate reflect differences in inflation, not some expert's prediction of what exchange rates will do in the future. So currency is a choice. Make sure you make the choice that's right for you. Third, and this is an issue that's not just specific to emerging market companies. It's a little unfair to make them the, the brunt of my, my assault. But let's face it. In emerging markets, you're far more likely to be investing in companies where you have little or no role in how the companies run. Part of it reflects the history of these markets. They used to be dominated by family-owned businesses, often in groups. They've gone public, but the families still control these companies. So one of the questions, and this is a question I asked at the start of the last class, was should I apply a discount? I think the answer we came up was it depends, right? It depends on what? It depends on what you've already built into your discounted cash flow valuation. If you've built in the presumption that these companies will continue to be badly run, there's not much you can do about it, you're done. There's no discount to apply because the value already reflects it. If in your valuation you made this hopeful assumption of change, of margins changing, the company doing better, 
then you have a problem because if you have very, very bad corporate governance, the question is how is the change going to happen? It's like the Hormel example. You might have to value the company twice. Okay? So I'm going to give you an example of a company, and this was from way back, almost 20 years ago that I valued when, on one of my trips back to where I grew up in India. It's a company called Tube Investments. It's part of a family group, a South, South Indian family group. It's been around a long time. It's a fairly well-regarded, very conservatively run company. So they were, they were so they found out I was coming in, and I've known the people who run this company since I was a little kid, so I couldn't say no. So they said, can you come in and talk about a value? And they said, they were very open about why. They said, the stock is trading at four times earnings, a P-E ratio of four, and we think it's unfair. We think we're worth more. I said, are you sure you want me to come in? Because I'm not, I might not confirm what you think is true about your company. I'm, they said, no, no, well, let's talk about value. So I went in and did a valuation of the company. And as I do this valuation, I like to think about what in this valuation is driving my ultimate result. Because I got a value lower than the price. Remember they're complaining the price was too low? I got a value lower. Here's what I saw. I saw a company that was growing aggressively. In what sense? It was reinvesting a lot. In fact, they'd reinvested 116% of their after-tax operating income the year that before they called me in. And I looked at their history, and they went back and forth. There were quite a few acquisitions. So I looked at a smoothed out number. I gave them a 60% reinvestment rate. They were making about 9.2% as their return on capital. Sounds OK, right, 9.2%. But remember, this is India in 2000. Inflation is in the double digits. My cost of capital for the company was 16.9%. They're growing aggressively, and they're taking projects that make 9.2%. There's almost zero chance this company is ever going to be run by anybody in, other than the family. Since they don't, didn't seem to think they had a problem, why would they fix it? If you don't think you have a problem, you're not going to fix it. So I left the return on capital at 9.2% in perpetuity and put them into stable growth. So everything I did about the company looks the same, except for the fact that they're destroying value as they grow, and they will continue to destroy value in perpetuity. So I finished the valuation. I come up with 62 rupees per share, well below the price. They're shocked. And their first reaction is, you've been too conservative in giving us a growth of only 5.5%. We can grow faster. I said, OK. So you're going to reinvest more? I said, yeah, push up the reinvestment rate towards like 90%. So if I push up the reinvestment rate, I hold everything else constant, increase the reinvestment rate to 90%. What do you think will happen to my value per share? It dropped to 45 It completely threw them off, because they were used to thinking higher growth means so I kept pushing it up. I said, if you want 100%, 150%, you have higher growth, but your value kept going down. And finally, they realized that this was a fruitless exercise. So I said, given how you run, you know what's going to maximize your value? What reinvestment rate will maximize your value? Probably minus 100%. Just liquidate the company, go home. But, <coughs> but that's probably too extreme. I said, if you lower the reinvestment rate to zero, you send your investment teams home, the investment teams are in the room, and they're all sort of saying, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Okay? <laughs> You're going to be worth more as a company. It's very cynical almost if you think about it. You're trying so hard, and as you try so hard, your value goes down. It reminds me of the, uh, there's actually a research paper, a very cruel one that was written about 15 years ago looking at active money managers. And it actually did a very, very simple experiment. You know how money managers reveal their positions at the start of every year, right? So this study actually went in and asked a simple question. If you froze active money managers' positions at what they told you at the start of the year, and you looked at the returns that are made over the course of the year, how different would those returns be from the actual returns? Because the actual returns come from the fact that they keep trying, right? They, they come in, they pick stocks. It was minus 2%. All that activity during the course of the year actually lowered their returns by 2%. You're getting something similar here. You're trying you to grow. You're taking all these projects. You're going to new businesses. You're doing acquisitions in the process of what's happening. You're lowering your value each time you do it. So I said, what should we do? The answer is very simple. Right? One is if you want to keep growing, you've got to grow smarter. You've got to earn higher returns. So my first try here is what I did. I said, I know it's too late to fix your old projects. Your old projects, you're stuck in businesses. What if at least on the new projects, you can earn a higher return on capital? They said, but we can't make 16.8%. There's nothing out there. I said, what do you push towards 12%? It's still a bad product, but not as bad. With a 12% return on capital, holding all else constant, the value that I get is 84 rupees. It used to be 62, goes to 84. 
if they can earn their cost of capital, I'm not even saying take zero net present value projects, the value per share would, have go, would go up to almost $100 per share. And if they can fix all their existing projects to earn their cost of capital, then the value per share you get is 111 rupees per share. When you have a company with horrifically bad returns, and some of you do have companies with horrifically bad returns because they're in bad businesses, and you get a low value and you try to fix it by making them grow faster, you're going to find that it actually cuts in the wrong direction because if you can't earn more than the cost of capital, increasing the growth rate is not your pathway to delivering value. And I want to introduce this notion of return on capital and existing assets on new projects. It's easier to fix your problems about taking new projects than it is to fix existing projects. Because once you get into businesses that are bad businesses, it's very difficult to extract yourself. So if you have an emerging market company or a developed market company that's earning below the cost of capital and you're struggling with a value that's way lower than you want it to be, the fix is you've got to raise the return on capital because changing the growth rate, reinvesting more, will just only make a bad problem into a worse problem. So that's a corporate governance issue. One final point about emerging market companies, and again, this is not isolated to emerging market companies, is cross-holdings are a clear and present danger. That's the way they were. Again, it's not something they did to get, get you into trouble or to give you. This is the way they were built up. And when we talk about a company like Tata Motors or Tata Steel and you value the company and you think you're done, we talked about how cross-holdings can come in and make life difficult. And we talked about why cross-holdings are so difficult to value. They're opaque. You don't have the information. And if you're working on the quiz, you notice that this is the problem that's always the most difficult problem. Because cross holdings, should I add that? Should I subtract that? Should I multiply that? And it's all these strains, minority holdings, majority holdings. But to show you how the problem can kind of take over your valuation, I actually valued, don't even try to read this page, I actually valued four different Tata companies. Tata Steel, Tata Motors, Tata Chemicals, and Tata Consulting Services. Bo all four are part of the Tata group. And an evaluation. Don't worry about the valuation. I valued each company as an intrinsic valuation. With each valuation, though, once I got the value of the operating assets, I had to look up the value of the cross holdings. I'm going to show you a graph that will show you why I feel wary about all of these companies. See the, see the red portion of the graph? That is the portion of the value per share with each company that came from their cross holdings. So when I valued Tata Chemicals, almost half my value came from my cross holdings. So when you buy Tata Chemicals, you think you're buying Tata Chemicals? You're buying Tata Chemicals in a portfolio of Tata companies. Tata Steel, Tata Motors, and then you get to TCS. It's a company with the least problem. Why? One is they're doing well, but there's something else that reflects what type of company they are. And How did Tata Motors get that big cross holdings in Tata Steel? Because 50 years ago, the Tata Group was a privately held family group. So Tata Steel had to build a plant. It did not have the money. Guess what the family did? They took the money out of Tata Motors. It was actually a, it was an internal capital market. They took it out of Tata Motors, put it into Tata Steel, and the accounting was they gave shares, which at that stage was just shares in another private company. This is a reflection of the history of these companies. You know why TCS has the least problem? because it's not been around for as long. It's the youngest of the companies, and because of the youngest of the companies, and it came into being after the Tata Group went public, you don't have as much of a problem. So with these family group companies, the biggest problems are in the legacy companies. The companies have been around a long time. And as you move further into the younger companies, you can take the Samsung Group, and you see the same phenomenon play out. The older Samsung companies have much bigger cross-holding issues than the younger Samsung companies, simply because of their history. Now, the problem, though, is when you buy shares in a company like Tata Motors, you're really not buying shares in just Tata Motors. You're buying shares in Tata Motors and a portfolio of other Tata companies. And that's a much dicier proposition in intrinsic valuation because you really haven't valued that portfolio. You don't have the, the access to the data. You really are going to be much more uncertain about your valuation. Now, I wish this, this problem were isolated to emerging market companies, but you know, in many developed market companies, it's becoming an increasing issue that you have to deal with frontally. Yeah. 
Finally, truncation risk with emerging market companies. Again, not restricted to emerging market companies, but clearly a bigger issue with them. Yes? Okay. This is this. Did everybody get the question in Singapore? In, in Spain, for instance, it's almost like companies are trying to get you. Company A will own thirty percent of Company B, and Company B will own twenty percent of Company A. It's almost like you have to do simultaneous equations in your head while you're in the company. You actually have to value parent companies. My suggestion is, if you have cross holdings, don't try to value consolidated companies. It'll be a mess because you're valuing so value. Parent, you know, company A and company B as parent at the parent company level, then the rest becomes easy, right? Because once you have the parent company valuation of the two companies, the value of the shares in company A will be the value of the parent company in company A plus 20% of the parent company B. So any time cross holdings are rising to the level where you say, I don't even know what's going on, go back to the parent company level. It's going to be, give you a clean evaluation. And that, but that does assume you have a parent and a consolidated. Thank God is the rule in much of the world. But if you have parent company numbers, that's what I would do is go back to the parent company numbers, try to value just the parent company, and do the same thing with company B, and then do the, the algebra you need. <coughs> Finally, truncation risk, as I said, not restricted to emerging market companies, but a bigger issue, but a bigger issue with them than with other companies. One, of course, is natural disasters. I remember doing a valuation seminar in Antigua. Why did I do it in Antigua? It was the middle of winter in New York. And I got a call from Antigua saying, would you like to do a valuation seminar in Antigua? I said, where's Antigua? <laughs> he said, it's in the Caribbean. I said, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> so this is what happens when you have a blizzard. Anything in a warm climate, you go. I land and I'm talking about valuation. And I'm talking about exchange rate risk and interest rate risk. I mean, all, and then one of the guys in the room says, the biggest risk we face here is a hurricane. Because 80% of the people in the room, their businesses were tourism related. A hurricane could wipe them out. And it's a, it, you're saying, that's the big risk? That is the big risk. Okay. It could be, of course, terrorism risk. In much of the world, this has risen to the surface. You know, I remember valuing an Egyptian hotel. And the biggest issue there was, how do you bring in the likelihood that something bad can happen to you? Because it was right after a couple of bombings at you know, some high-profile hotels. There are two ways you can bring in something like terrorism risk. One is. If you can buy full insurance against terrorism risk, you can bring it in as a cost, lower your cash flows. Okay? The second is you can do it the way we did to stress risk, attach a probability that something bad will happen and say, what's the outcome? But one way or the other, you can't be in denial and ignore it. Anybody here valuing a Venezuelan company this semester? I thought not. And you can see why, right? I mean, it's, it's going to be really, really, really difficult. Think about the truncation risk that face you. We're, and I said early on in this process, we're good in finance at dealing with continuous risk. We're awful at dealing with truncation risk. And that's why statistics and probability might stand you in better stead than traditional finance, because that's really what your statistics class should have trained you for, is to deal with truncation risk, decision trees, simulations. Bring them into the process. You have much better tools to deal with truncation risk. Let's talk about banks. I wrote my first valuation book in the late 80s. And until between 88 and 2008, every one of my valuation books, there was a chapter on valuing banks. And it started with a sentence that I've never been able to live down. The sentence I started with was, valuing banks is easy. <laughs> and then the rest of the chapter followed. And I don't apologize for it. And I thought valuing banks were e was easy, but it was built on two presumptions. The first is the presumption that banks are run by sensible people. I used to think that. And that second presumption was there's a regulatory overlay that actually works. And I believe that as well. You see why those two assumptions made valuing banks easy? If banks are run by sensible people and you have a regulatory overlay that works, for sensible people pay out in dividends what they can afford to. So I. Look at the, and you're saying, why do I care about it? Because if I ask you, what are your cash flows from existing assets for a bank, how do we compute cash flows? We start with earnings, even with equity cash flows, and we add depreciation, subtract capex, subtract change in working capital. Almost impossible to do with a bank. So you could try, and then you gave up. It's, I don't know what the cash flows are. But I trust the managers when they say, I can pay out 30% of my earnings as dividends. And second, 
The regulatory overlay became critical because with banks you have no idea how much risk is being taken, but because they regulated, made the assumption that there's no such thing as a really risky bank, that banks all are in a much tighter spectrum. So we often use the same cost of equity across banks, saying they all have the same risk. Banks were the last bastion for the dividend discount model. People still value many banks with a dividend discount model, and what's driving it is desperation. I don't know what the cash flows are, so I'm going to discount dividends instead. <coughs> that was until 2008, and then 2008 woke me up. I no longer think banks are run by sensible people. I think banks are run by some of the most senseless, crazy people in the face of the earth. Banks have, in talk, in talk about inertia and metooism, banks are the worst culprits. They will continue to pay dividends while their regulatory capital is melting down. You ask them why, they say, we don't want to send the wrong signal. Really? Everybody knows you're a disaster and you continue to pay dividends. You're in denial. I mean, it's not as if you're sending a negative signal when you cut dividends, but they refuse to cut dividends. And we know the regulatory overlay didn't hold up, which left me in a really bad position in 2009 when I had to write an addition on valuing banks. I no longer start with a sentence, Valuing banks is easy because by 2009, people were just giving up. They were bailing out on banks saying, I have no idea what it's worth. So I'm going to show you the old way in which I valued banks, and then we'll talk about what I think about banks now. The old way I valued banks is I took the present value of dividends. So I took the old way and applied it to value an Egyptian bank called CIB Egypt. It's a well-established Egyptian bank. I you no, know, it took the earnings, projected out the dividends. So everything was about the... And the nice thing about dividend discount models is you don't have to do any estimation, right? You just take the dividends. It's given. Cash flows. You assume that dividends are your cash flows to equity. How do you get future growth? Well, we use the standard equation, return on equity times retention ratio. So in a sense, I'm taking the dividend discount model, pushing it through. And I did take a risk, and I valued the bank entirely in Egyptian pounds. It's kind of messy to do because the Egyptian government doesn't have 10-year government bonds. So the way I got the risk-free rate was I actually took the U.S. T-bond rate and then used that inflation differential. Remember we said you can get a risk-free rate in any currency? The inflation in Egypt was 9.7% when I did this, so I adjusted for that higher inflation. My risk-free rate was 10.5%. So I projected our dividends discounted back at an Egyptian pound cost of equity. I got a value per share of almost 42 pounds uh, Egyptian pounds per share. Stock was actually trading at 36. I tried to buy it. I couldn't even figure out how to do it. Now, it's actually some of the emerging markets. You can't even get to the stock. It's not like there's an ADR on it. I finally gave up. But now, if I'd been able to buy it, I'd have, now, I don't have any Egyptian stocks in my portfolio. But it's a, it's a classic dividend discount model. Implicit there is the assumption that CIB is run by sensible people. And the Egyptian banking regulatory authorities actually do their job. I, now that I think about it, maybe I will not buy CIB for a while. But that's the implicit assumption we use dividend discount models. Here's a second dividend discount model, m much more well-recognized name. This is Goldman Sachs a month before the crisis. Now, there's a story here. And I, you know, it's not a happy story, but I'll complete it anyway. So I took Goldman Sachs. At that time, a high-growth bank. You're saying, I can't use a dividend discount model with a high-growth bank. You can, as long as you don't leave the dividends fixed. So here's how I brought it in. Initially, I left the payout ratio at only nine, at about 8%. They didn't pay out much. But in return, I gave them a high-growth rate because they were taking that high retention ratio and earning a sky-high return equity. Remember, this is pre-crisis banking returns. I gave them a high-growth rate. I projected out the, cash, the dividends based on that high-growth rate. At some point in time, just like with every other company, I started to scale the growth down. And when you scale growth down, guess what your dividends should be doing? They should be going up. So I adjusted my payout ratio as my growth came down. By the time I get to stable growth, I'm paying out 60% of my earnings as dividends and growing at a, at, at a growth rate I can sustain forever. So my payout ratio actually starts at 8%. And as, so it's just like a reinvestment rate, but I'm adjusting my payout rate as I go through time. I discounted them back at a cost of equity that reflected where I was in time, 2008 August. I was using an equity risk premium of 4% for the U.S. Remember, it stayed, the implied premium dropped to 4%. My cost of equity reflected that low risk premium. I discount those cash flows back. I got a value per share of 222, and the stock was trading at 169. Now here comes the sad story. I actually bought it. <laughs> and of course, a month later, you had the crisis. By December, the stock was down to 72. 
You're saying, why didn't you sell? It's too, after it happened, you no, know, you can sell, but you're just bailing out at that stage. I didn't see the crisis coming. I never saw the crisis coming. I never see any crisis coming. So this is just the way it is. Yeah. But on a dividend discount model, it looked cheap to me. So the reason I showed you the Goldman is sometimes people say you can't use the dividend discount model in a high growth bank with a low payout ratio. You can as long as you, you can actually use a dividend discount model in a non-dividend paying bank. You know how? Is you have zero dividends until the growth starts level off. Then you estimate what payout ratio you would have in your four. So you can actually use the dividend discount model, but when you do use the dividend discount model, you are making that assumption that banks are doing what they should be doing. If they're paying no dividends, it's because they have negative cash flows. If they're paying low dividends because they have low cash flows. If they increase their cash flows, those cash flows will come to you as an investor. So let's start with a couple of statements about banks. The first is they're remarkably opaque businesses. If you don't believe me, pick up the annual report for a bank, read it, and see if you truly understand what's going on. It's really, really difficult. It's not that they don't try. It's just very difficult to convey the kind of information with the bank that will help you. And for a long time, we made a Faustian bargain. We said that's OK, because the regulatory guys will have the access to the internal stuff. They will make sure the banks are not doing something stupid. That's why that trust in regulatory authorities is so critical. So when you look at the dividend discount model, this is an implicit assumption. It's opaque, okay, opaque but it's OK, because the regulatory guys will do their job. And as we said, no, that's not always true. So let's look at whether you can bring in regulatory overlay into banks. So this was in October of 2008. I was still stuck with the dividend discount model, because that's all I knew with banks. And I was trying to value Wells Fargo three weeks into the crisis. The numbers had not changed in terms of you know, the, the most recent income earnings report came before the crisis. So all I was trying to figure out is how do I bring into, I knew I needed to bring into my valuation the fact that a crisis had happened. So I was looking for mechanisms. The first, of course, you saw with the 3M valuation. I'm in the middle of a crisis. What's the number that's going to reflect that I'm in the middle of a crisis? My equity risk premiums were much higher. So first thing I did was I used a much a, a higher risk premium than I was using in August. The second is, at least with banks, as in, because this was a banking crisis, I knew, knew there was another shoe waiting to drop. I didn't know how, how much it would drop, but I knew that there were more regulatory capital requirements coming, because that's what the banks were lacking. So the second thing I built in was a much higher requirement for regulatory capital. We did a piece of this valuation when we were talking about return equity, where I said, what happens with return equity with, with, of a bank? When regulatory capital goes up, your regulatory capital goes up, your return equity drops, your return equity drops, your growth decreases. Nothing about Far Wells Fargo changed, but because I was making an assumption of greater regulatory capital, my expected return on equity was much lower than it was, the, than the historical return, brought down the growth rate. The value per share that I got was about 30. Wells Fargo share price had gone from 52 to, th and 52 to 33. So one of the reasons I did this, I said, as a contrarian investor, maybe this is a good time to buy Wells Fargo. Maybe they're just melting down for the wrong reasons. So I was hoping to find a value much higher than 33. But once I brought in the higher risk premium and the expectations of more regulatory capital, that value very quickly started to melt down. So when you're valuing banks, this regulatory capital issue is kind of hanging out in the back. And in a traditional dividend discount model, the only place you can really show it is through the expected return on equity. That's kind of a blunt instrument. Because if you're truly undercapitalized, it's not just your return equity. It might mean that you have to raise fresh equity. There are a whole host of things are missing in this model. But within a dividend discount model, that's basically all I can do. So f for financial service firms, I'm going to argue it's for one set of companies. I've given up on book value on almost every other sector. But with financial service firms, I still care about book value. You know why? Because regulatory capital is closely connected to book value. It's not book equity, but when your book equity drops, I can almost guarantee you the tier one, tier two, tier three capital, all those regulatory capital. And for banks, that is the number that I care about. So I, in 2009, that's where I went. I said, look, I can't trust dividends, but if I don't have dividends, I need cash flows. I can't do cash flows the traditional way because I don't know what capex, depreciation, working capital is for a bank. I want to think about what reinvestment in a bank would mean. How do you get high growth in a bank? What is it that puts your survival? 
and I latched onto regulatory capital. So I'm going to give you my definition of free cash or equity for a bank. You can tell me what you think about it. You can use it. You can not use it. You start with net income. That's given. But some of that net income, I'm going to argue, has to go back into regulatory capital. How much? One is it will depend on how much you want to grow. If you're a fast-growing bank, more has to be put into regulatory capital because otherwise you can't grow. And if you're an undercapitalized bank, you've dug yourself into a hole, you've got to come up with even more regulatory capital. If I take my net income and subtract out what I need to reinvest in regulatory capital, I've got a free cash flow equity for a bank. Now, it sounds incredibly abstract, but let me show you a 2016 valuation of a banking institution. It's actually a blog post where I said a Greek tragedy at a German bank. You know, I use the word Greek and German in the same thing, right? The Germans like to pick on the Greeks all the time of how horribly run the Greek economy is, and usually they're right. But here you have the ultimate German banking institution looking like a Greek bank. And if you look at the history of Deutsche, the post-2008, it's been disaster after disaster after disaster. They've been losing money, losing money, losing money. He's saying, what, every time you lose money, your regulatory capital is decreasing. When book equity drops, your regulatory capital is gone. I did this valuation right after they got a chop on the neck from the US government, which fined them $15 billion, this is in 2016, for their role in the 2008 crisis. Remember, $15 billion fine for a bank means your book equity is going to collapse, your regulatory capital is going to go through the floor. People were freaking out at the time I was doing this valuation. The, the Deutsche CDS had jumped through the roof. People were worried about defaulters. There was talk about the German government stepping in. You're not going to, a bank like Deutsche, you can't shut it down. There'll be a, you know, somebody going to step in and run. This is talk about the German government stepping in and essentially making it almost a government-owned bank for a while until they fixed it. So I decided to value Deutsche. So I'll give you where I started. They were losing money. So the dividend discount model is gone. There's no dividends, losing money. I can't even use the dividend discount model. So I fixed the company again on my spreadsheet. So I made their losses into profits by focusing on what I think they could generate as a return in equity in steady state. Now what I assume they could make if they succeed and became a going concern, that they could make at least their cost of equity which I don't think is unrealistic. You can't have banks collectively. So over time, the return equity is going to go from a negative to a positive number. Losses become profit. That was the easy part. The second thing I focused on is that tier one regulatory capital ratio was 12.4%. I hate, hated reading up all this stuff on regulatory capital. But if you have capital IQ, you can pull up these numbers for individual banks, so it's 12.4%. Over time, I assumed, and that was too low. Everybody knew it was too low. The bank knew it was too low. They wanted to bring it up. They didn't give me a target, but I knew they wanted to bring it up. I pushed that regulatory capital ratio to 15.67%, which is the tier one capital ratio, the 75th percentile of all banks. Why does it have to be higher than a typical bank? Because it is an investment banking and a riskier arm. Its tier one capital ratio will be high. So that 12.41% has to go to 15.67% which means I've got to estimate regulatory capital every year, and that change in regulatory capital is what I put in as my capex. You subtract that from net income. What's my free cash flow equity in year one? Minus 11.7 billion. Year two, minus 3.7 billion. Based on my reading of Deutsche, it looks like they'll have to raise a lot of equity in the next three years. But I now have a free cash flow equity that I can discount at the cost of equity. And I actually estimated costs of equities for banks in different percentiles. So I took all banks and I said, what's a risky bank look like? I actually backed out. Remember how I did an implied cost of equity for the S&P 500? I did it for segments of banks, 75th, 50th, 25th percentile. I gave them a, 70, a high cost of equity for a bank because they were so lightly capitalized. Took the present value. The value per share I got was 23. And I did add in the possibility that they're one more shock away from the German government stepping in. Another fine, they're done. And I came up with a value of 21. This is a story that had a happy beginning, but not necessarily a happy ending. I did buy the shares at 1333, and I rode the wave for a while. They had a rights issue that they had. They had to make the rights issue to raise the 10 billion. Luckily, I sold half my shares. Why luckily? Because this is a bank that seems to find new crises around. They're in a fresh crisis. So you want to value a bank in a crisis? Just pick Deutsche, valued every year. Another crisis, another, another try at it.
but it's a different way of thinking about valuation, but you've got to be a little creative about what CapEx is. I will see you on Monday, so I'll send you the seating chart and everything else. So. Time if I move, move the beta, it's going to be. Okay, so two questions. Can you get the 10% probability of our uh, uh, For your Deutsche? Yeah. It's, it's, the reason I didn't use a higher number is it's too large to fail. Yeah, sure. So, in fact, people will find ways. So if this had been a smaller bank, an East European bank, I'd have got a 40%, 50%. The bigger a bank gets, the smaller the number is because the German government does not want to take over Deutsche. They will do whatever they can, to, and the other banks don't want Deutsche to go under. So think of how hard people tried to save Lehman. Mm -hmm. They tried for months before it actually happened. So I think that that alone will, but it's not zero because there is a real chance that it's a big enough shock that will be pushed over. But it's going to be a low number simply because they're so big. Thank you. Yeah, just by, by, the end of the week, by the end of the week. Okay, all right, perfect. Thank you. Assume tier one capital ratios. Yeah. Is there a reason why you didn't just like take the mandatory requirements and assume they're going to try yeah, to hold because, these costs as possible? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that mandatory requirements are a, are a floor. Yeah. Most banks like to keep a buffer. A bit right? of a buffer. And the question is, to like so you could actually, low, right? you could actually use the mandatory numbers as your target, and just say, I just want to go to the mandatory numbers, and that might depend on your story for the bank. Is the bank run by conservative people, or is it run by aggressive? Because aggressive bankers will push towards the regulatory minimum. Yeah. Conservative bankers will push that. So I could have chosen the regulatory minimum. I think was 14 percent, not 15.67. When I yeah. did this, because it, it's going to vary depending on your asset base and the, how the risk-adjusted asset. Yeah, and obviously if they set yeah. it for you. Yeah. So you could have. Yeah. You, I could have shot for the regulatory minimum. Okay. In which case, I'd have also given them a higher cost of equity. I moved their cost of equity. To